My humble respect to Guru Mahan, Guru Piran, Sri Sankaran, Guru Piran Mio, fellow Nyanis. Um, today I'm going to continue with uh, Swamiji's uh, teachings, the 10th principle. Uh, this is part three. We've covered part one and part two. Uh, part one, I spoke about um, how the origin of human beings and how we have evolved um, from you know, uh, the beginning. Uh, and we came to a state where in part two, I spoke about how we as a species have, uh, uh, although we are called humans, in the scientific term, we are called homo sapiens. And uh, how we have become a very successful species uh, over the many years compared to all the other uh, species uh, uh, to dominate the world, pretty much, uh, you know. Uh, we have expanded our species. Uh, we have, uh, you know, we control uh, pretty much every resource uh, on earth. And, uh, and over time, we have become very powerful. And, uh, and what we have seen is that what has made us very, uh, you know, successful as a species compared to all the other species. And in that, I spoke about how the evolution of the human mind uh, and what are the conditions that essentially enable the human mind to evolve at a faster pace and grow bigger and build neural networks. And that helps uh, helped us to process information better. And in that process, we are the only species that have developed a language uh, that we can use to communicate ideas and uh, over time uh, pass on that knowledge to the next generation. No other species can do this. And we are continuously evolving. Uh, and this in Tamil we say Parinama Valarchi. This is the civilization, civilizational evolution and development. Uh, over the period of our evolution, um, there are challenges that we had to overcome. There are things that we also uh, were able to uh, develop. Uh, so how far has the human uh, species uh, gone in terms of development? Uh, are we there yet? Uh, you know, if we see the history, there's a lot of uh, turmoil and challenges and wars and tribalism. And to some extent, we have brought some level of order. But where we are going as a species, Right? And what is the role of knowledge, wisdom, knowledge, and meditation in our evolutionary uh, development? So I want to today continue this journey of uh, we as a species. If we don't understand who we are, how do we then manage ourselves and how do we move forward and how do we pass on uh, the knowledge to the next generation to go on and, and develop themselves? So in this, Swamiji speaks about this evolution and the role of spirituality, the role of uh, uh, discipline, the role of uh, you know, introspection, contemplation, reflection, and meditation. So the last time I stopped at the point where we as a species, we have evolved. We used to be tribes. We used to be like any other animals, you know, uh, fighting for survival. Uh, and over time, we migrated to different places. And in that competition, uh, our brain evolved. And as our brain evolved, we became more and more intelligent, more and more strategic. And over time, uh, as migration took place, we started adopting and adopting new things. And we started becoming more strategic we started becoming tribes and eventually forming families and communities and towns and cities and nations and ultimately as a global community. So in all this, we see that the evolution of the human mind has brought in greater cooperation, collaboration, learning from one another and becoming you know, agile and adaptable. But how is it that, you know, in some areas we have done very well, in many areas we are still lagging behind? So this is something that we want to study. And what is the role of spirituality and also uh, self-realization and uh, the path towards 
uh, you know, the yoga and meditation and so on. So we have, uh, you know, evolved. So we see that we have been very successful as a species, you know, we have become, uh, you know, uh, because of that, you know, uh, evolution from a tribal, you know, like animals to tribal to communities, right up to global communities, the population started thriving. And as the population grew, uh, we needed to provide food. Uh, we needed to provide uh, basic necessities. And if we did not provide, they will start fighting back like animals, right? So, uh, so knowing that, you know, this is going to happen and given that our evolution, um, you know, humanity or, or people came together and said, how do we meet the needs of the population? So again, uh, whenever there is shortage, you'll see that, you know, uh, we will revolve back to, you know, some of the instinctive animalistic qualities, fighting for things and so on. So because we were evolving, we realized that we needed to be more strategic in ensuring there's adequate food, shelter, and all the other things that comes with life. So to do this, there was a shift in our mindset. And this is where about 12,000 BC, the agricultural revolution started. So communities came together and said, look, let's work together to you know, grow crops. This is because of necessity. There were famine and there were you know, a lot of poverty. And people came together and said, look, how do we have? This is 12,000 BC, right? And uh, of course, our Earth is about 4.5 billion years. And you know, this is many, many years of evolution. We as a species, as I went through the timeline, but 12,000 BC, we, humanity or human beings or homo sapiens came together and realized that they need to strategically work. So this is the leap in the mind. This intelligence shifted to be able to be more strategic to provide food for the populations. So this happened 12,000 BC. So you always see that whenever there is a crisis or whenever there is a challenge or whenever there is a, you know, uh, something very serious, the human mind makes that leap to be able to find the solution. And this is crucial because this is what is part of our DNA that will then help us uh, unlock during the most challenging period, the most creative part of us comes out. And we started, you know, um, not only uh, agriculture, we started domesticating animals. So here we see that not only managing ourselves, uh, we also started you know, looking at wild animals and, and taming them and, uh, you know, domesticating them. And uh, to do that is amazing. You know, can you imagine the human mind had to evolve to understand itself and then uh, understand other species. And we started, uh, you know, uh, managing other species and we started using them for uh, crops and many, many things. No other species has done this. And so, so because of necessity and because the need to provide food and we needed, you know, uh, the, the, the energy and, 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 and resources, uh, the mind leaped towards, you know, uh, using what is nature's already provided. So we started, you know, having major crop farming, domesticating animals, you know, and we started producing major crops and plantations started emerging. You know, and this is thousands of years providing food for, 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 for the general population. And over 10,000 years later, we started seeing, you know, you can't just rely on agriculture crops. We domesticated animals. We use the animals for, for you know, food, you know, for, for leather, a whole range. So the human mind is starting to evolve more necessities, meeting the needs of so whenever there is a demand or, or a crisis or a need, the human mind makes that leap. And oftentimes it is, you know, uh, a few key people that think very deeply that is able to make that leap and then educate that population. And you see this trend over time. And, and this is where we've got to learn from our species that how we are able to evolve. This is Parinama Valarji. No? So... And then what happened was that we have a lot of goods, but how do we trade it? You know, we, I may have a lot of crops, uh, but I want fish. So uh, I need to have a way, I can't eat all these crops. I need to be able to trade and see the mine leaped again. And we came up with trading goods. So barter systems came in. Now we're talking about markets. How do we 
uh, cooperate with people to be able to meet our needs. If we fight with everybody like tribes, we will not be able to meet the needs. So we started seeing the human mind starting to evolve uh, in terms of, uh, you know, the barter system came in, we exchange goods, we need to be good to people, we need to be able to access resources. So all that started refining the human mind and the neural pathway started shifting and refining and aligning to becoming individualistic, to becoming more of a social uh, being. And we started seeing that now we've got access to resources, we got access to, uh, you know, organized farms, we can exchange, the population started growing even further. So we as a species, we grew rapidly. Uh, with increase in rapid growth, we need to not only provide food shelter, we also have to be more creative in using our resources. So, so thinkers started coming, you know, people like Mahans and great saints and sages, who are those days the scientists too, the social reformers, say so how do we meet this needs of this population? So, and we started seeing, you know, trade starting to expand, population starting to expand, you know, <clears throat> the goods, I can exchange goods, but you know, there are other needs I have, right? So I, if, if, if I'm a farmer, I've got, you know, some crops, you know, but I want fish, I can trade. But if I want houses and other things, how do I trade? How much, you know, uh, a wheat can somebody buy? So the human mind started thinking, how do we trade this? And this is where we started seeing the sophistication of the human mind started, you know, as I said, continuously refining, refining, refining. And we started, you know, in 3000 BC, we developed money a medium of exchange. Before it was just goods and it was not very effective, right? So we developed, we became more sophisticated to create money, a mode of exchange. This is 3000 BC, right? The first money that came into being that I can exchange my fish for money and then I can use the money to buy. So that required a lot of sophistication but of course, you know, uh, these money was all based on minerals that they had as, as, as uh, very scarce resources, right? So here, I want you to remember that, that as time went on, as the needs of society increased, the human mind had to make that leap to refine, to become more sophisticated, to become more creative, to meet the needs of society, right? So what does that mean? So Money and people started cheating, you know, they, you know, they started taking the money, diluting it for one gold coin, they become 10 gold coins. So uh, there was a lot of, uh, you know, uh, dilution and that had an impact. So then people thought, okay, if we had money, then we need to be a little bit more sophisticated. So we need to have regulation, right? So laws came in being. So there needs to be, you know, laws to regulate you know, the money market or the commonly agreed, uh, you know, uh, agreements. So you start seeing laws coming into play and who's going to regulate the law? So this is where the sophistication increased further. So we had an authority. So we needed an authority that would enforce this. So society then developed a system of authority. Somebody needs to be given that authority to say this is right or wrong and so on, and that normally, you know, you had kings and princes and, you know, uh, people that manage a particular locality and so on. So they were given authority to manage this, uh, this, this uh, uh, regulation. And so that is how we see that, you know, the monarchs and others. So another form of sophistication of organizing society, remember, we came from kind of like an animalistic to tribal to now we are moving towards more sophistication uh, in terms of how we organize ourselves. But that could not have happened if not for the sophistication and the leap in the human mind, right? So, so we started seeing, ah, then we started seeing that, okay, besides the king, we needed to organize people. We needed people to become... Uh, obedient and, and following the laws. And this is where we started seeing religion playing an important role, uh, moral conducts, you know, uh, good civic behavior, brotherhood, 
all those things. So we started seeing the emergence of religions to, to organize people and to give a harmonious way of life. Another form of sophistication. So again, you see that, you know, this as the institutions reform, the reform came from that human mind to be able to create greater harmony so that society is able to develop in a very sustainable way. So we have systems of authority, you know, from monarchs to, you know, religions to, to various uh, forms of institution. By the way, institutions are a artifact of the human mind to create greater harmony, right? And more recently, I mean, you know, uh, we see that, you know, over uh, uh, time, we evolve towards not just a single person authority, but we have a democratic process where we have the parliament and others. So again, another form of sophistication in our thinking of how we bring the people power to be able to manage uh, the people. So again, all this is really fascinating how we as a species were able to organize ourselves. But this would not have been possible if we did not have that, you know, enlightened, you know, uh, uh, an, an experience of, you know, intellectual uh, expansion and, and depth to be able to, to create these institutions. So we see that, you know, in all this, uh, you know, we as a species have evolved, uh, uh, you know, over time. And I just want to show you that evolution of, of, of us taking back uh, and then what led to this, this evolution of our species. And Mahan talks about this. The whole of I God speaks about this evolution of this human mind that shaped who we are as a species. So we have reached, that means how much we have, you know, reached. Each of us have, you know, we may have reached for ourselves or our family and wider reach and also richness, the quality that we live in. And if you see, um, the primitive uh, humans, uh, the, this is going back to, you know, they were primarily driven by instincts, somewhat like animals. You know, when you're hungry, you go and eat and you, 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 you know, if you find an animal, you, you know, uh, try to capture it or eat the roots. So there's a lot of sense of tribalism, you know, instinct driven tribalism, a lot of conflicts and war between people, right? And, uh, the reach that they have, they only looked after themselves then and there. If they're hungry now, they eat now, you know, they don't worry about tomorrow and so on. So the impact that they had was very, very limited to, to where they are. The conditions of living was very, very difficult during those periods, you know, sometimes uh, either you are a predator or a prey. I mean, either you are eaten or you eat somebody else. So it's that kind of a level and the lifespan for many people are very, very low. You know, they either died in conflicts, war, disease. So this is what our, our early uh, ancestors had. And, but as I mentioned, the, the, the evolution, you know, they started thinking, why are we fighting? Let's organize ourselves. So this Parinama Valarchi, the intellectual elevation uh, among some of the thinkers shaped society. And today we see in, 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 in more modern human beings, it is, uh, you know, we have dropped a lot of the instinct because of the, the evolution of our thinking, you know, the, the institutions that we have created from, you know, the way we organize ourselves, uh, you know, uh, religion. So this is where we see the religions play an important role in organizing societies with moral conduct, you know, a belief in something far bigger and greater uh, and this notion of sin and, and, and all those ideas, that if you do something bad, you're going to pay for this. All these are moral conducts to, to bring in greater discipline and greater harmony in society. So, so religion has played an important role in organizing society. So we see that over time, uh, this evolution has helped us become more and more knowledge driven. Uh, as we become more knowledgeable, there's greater cooperation. We realize that cooperation and collaboration are important. We're able to resolve conflicts, uh, you know. Uh, we have higher reach. We can, you know, have broader impact, not just to ourselves or family, but have bigger impact to society. And over time, right, whatever we, you know, ancestors do is passed on. And we have wider reach and impact. 
we have improved our uh, living conditions. You know, people used to live uh, 30, 35 years for male and females were much more lower because, uh, you know, they gave birth and, and the conditions were really bad. Many of them died in childbirth. So we have improved our living conditions and we've in increased our lifespan. So in spite of all this, are we any better? Right? So we've done all this great. So has society improved? Yes, to some extent we have improved, you know, better, uh, you know, uh, access to food systems, sanitation, healthcare, and so on. But deep down, we still, many of us still have the tribalism, the animal instinct. And, and this is why we see that we still have wars and we still have conflicts and we still solve problems in, in, in a primitive way. And uh, so how do we overcome this? So part of that primitiveness, this animal instinct, the tribalism is in our DNA. And in spite of the thousands of years of evolution, it shows up in our anger, our hatred, the fighting. And today you see what's happening in, 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 in Europe. Uh, you know, uh, this is another form of tribalism, right? So, so we're seeing this, you know, we are seeing conflicts. And this is a picture that is uh, uh, the current Ukraine con, uh, you know, where, you know, there is no mercy and, you know, there's massive slaughter. And so we are no different from the primitive humans. So in spite of all the technological developments, why are we still going back to this primitive way? Because it's encoded in our DNA. It is conditioned in our DNA. So if we are not watchful, it emerges back. So how do we overcome this, this modern human beings, though developed, we still have that, that primitiveness in us, the grossness in us. And this is where, you know, how do we shift from that? So in spite of being developed, we, are, we still have the primitive human uh, DNA in us, and the, driven by instinct, the power, you know, tribalism, you know, I am from this and I've got to wipe out somebody, another. So this genocide, and all those things still, you know, uh, uh, is, is there in human society, a lot of conflicts. Look at the living conditions through the war in Europe, you know, people 56 days, no water, no food, no different from the primitive human beings, right? Very low lifespan, many thousands of people are dying, right? So, so we've gone back, in spite of all the development, our human mind has gone back to that tribalistic, primitive human beings that's causing a lot of suffering. And this is not just the war, but we also, many people go through this war in their human mind. You know, hatred, jealousy, all those things that are... So if you see the in the scriptures, the Mahabharata war is actually about the war within ourselves, right? So the instinctive, you know, anger, hatred, all these are primitive qualities that brings miseries in our lives. So how do we move as a species in spite of this modern development, uh, you know, human beings with still a lot of misery in them? How do we move to a more harmonious, a more peaceful human being that creates, you know, uh, a more peaceful uh, uh, world that we live in? And Swamiji and other great saints uh, say that, look, you know, the only way we are going to get peace is that the only peace that we can get is when the human mind is at peace. If every individual is at peace, you see that the world will be at peace. So how do we do this? How do we inculcate this, this you know, peace within all of us? And this is what Swamiji speaks about that, uh, you know, the uh, universal peace sanctuary in all of us. It is not the power. It is not the material wealth. There is something within all of us that we need to transition to, 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 to shed off that primitive tribal uh, you know, qualities in us. So how do we do this? So how do we transition from this primitive modern human beings to the enlightened humans, what I call the CEOs, chief enlightenment officers? So it is not about just knowledge. Knowledge is one thing. The knowledge that we have could be used for good things or, or bad things. For example, we have discovered a lot of scientific things but we have you know, used that knowledge to create bombs and rockets and so on. So knowledge is one thing, but we need to know how to use this knowledge responsibly. So uh, with power comes responsibility. With power comes developing institutions that essentially makes us more responsible. 
So this is what we see that the evolution as a human species, we need to be driven by wisdom, knowledge, what is right and what is wrong. This notion of viveka, vairakya, which is sifting off what is real and unreal. This whole push towards universality instead of tribalism, the universal values, universal human values. Not that, you know, I am Russian or I am Ukrainian or I am this and I am that. That creates tribalism and indifferences. You know, we need to move towards we are part and parcel of this race that has humanity in us, the humanness, humaneness. This is what universality is. And to foster, instead of conflicts and wars, to resolve things, a more harmonious living, a more accepting, you know, uh, forgiving society, right? And, and this is how we attain that peace and, 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 and you know, and this, you know, uh, you know, we need to be able to not just look from a material perspective, but from a spiritual perspective, the spiritual impact you know, the, the push towards more land and occupying other people's countries and all these are from a material perspective. But, you know, in all of us, we have an abundance of that spiritual wealth. And, and if we are able to unlock that, then whatever limited material, I, you know, uh, wealth that we have, we're able to use it effectively. So we see that that embracement of the spiritual values and spiritual wealth that gives us a more inspirational life. And instead of, you know, a difficult living environment, you know, people may be living in a, you know, a bungalow house or driving big cars and so on, but they're still living in a difficult environment because the mind is still uh, tormented. The mind still has anger, hatred, you know. I remember uh, meeting a disciple that came to me, Guru, I have a big house, I've got several homes, but I haven't had good sleep, right? So you may have a lot of homes, but, you know, uh, Sometimes you don't get good sleep, but you know sometimes you may have a very small home, a hut, uh, and maybe even not even a home, but sleeping you know in, in in the corridors of things, and they have a very good sleep. So the quality of our life is not about how much material wealth that we have, but how little we need to sustain ourselves and harness the spiritual wealth. So this is where improving our quality of our ecosystem, both the internal and the external, iparamum, apparamum, you know, that's the inner cosmos and the external cosmos. And ultimately, when we do that, uh, it is not about increasing our lifespan, but increasing our quality of life, uh, you know, and, and the quality, you know, we may live up to 50 years old, but we have lived a quality life, you know, as opposed to living 100 years and we have not had peace and, and quality of life. So we see that, you know, the transition from the primitive to the primitive modern human beings to the enlightened humans. And this is what Swamiji speaks about in this non karol book. But to be able to do that, how do we get there? And this is where, you know, I said that the wisdom knowledge comes, not, it doesn't descend from heaven or externally. It requires us to put in the effort, like any other investments, right? We invest in financial assets, homes, in our children. If we want to harness that wisdom, knowledge within us, the treasure within us, we need to invest into our self, S-E-L-F, right? And that requires every day allocating time for introspection, contemplation, reflect, meditate, and put them to practice in every facet of our lives. And if we are able to do this, then we're able to transition from that modern primitive human beings with very gross thought to an enlightened human beings, a chief enlightenment officer, which is refined, universal, harmonious, spiritual, you know, and awesome ecosystem and quality of life. And this is what, uh, you know, Mahans and other great saints try to teach us in this journey. Sandosham.